Good evening. Uh, we're live here at Green Labs for tonight's event, and I'm here with Becca Williams. Becca, welcome. Hi. Uh, I, I, we're, we're running a little behind on the live segment, so tell us briefly about Free Speech TV. I, I just asked you, that's right here in Five Points. Sure. So as of a week ago, I was living in Florida and just moved here, so I am a newbie. Congratulations. Thank you, and the um, reason I did that is because I'm an executive producer of a television show called Marijuana Straight Talk, uprooting the stigmas and stereotypes of cannabis and the people who use it. And we got a green light from Free Speech Television Network, and so yes. uh, their studios are here, and so yes, they I are. needed to go where the studios are, and so that's why I have come out to Denver, and also it really makes sense. I came from Florida that is a pretty illegal state. They have a very narrow CBD only law right now, but to be able to do my work around uh, cannabis, I really needed to be in a place w that is not only medical legal, but also adult use. And so that's why I'm here. Well, obviously here in Colorado, if you're unaware, we do have a law that entitles you to possess marijuana legally as well as grow it. We still have the medical prescription card uh, if you're familiar with that, and uh, which allows you a little more leeway with regard to quantities and your grow capabilities such as that. But now that you're here in Denver, <laughs> yes. I mean, this is where cannabis is, so to speak, is it not? Arguably the cannabis capital. Of course, people in Portland and Seattle would probably argue with that. Arguably, Denver is the cannabis capital, or at least one of them. They can argue all they want. I, <laughs> and you I, find I, that there are a lot of people moving through the, the adult use states as far as authors or experts in the industry or people, pioneers, doing something in the cannabis arena. And so we're here to catch them all. Well, uh, we are all here. I mean, most of us, obviously, on Some the of us West aren't Coast. Some all there, well, but we're all here. <laughs> Physically, we're here. I, 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 we try not to uh, have them on the show. It's uh, real impossible. But uh, if you're just joining us, we're here live at Green Labs in at Denver, Colorado. Uh, we're available on Comcast Denver 56. I don't know if you were aware that we are online. And we're streaming also on the internet at WMMJTV slash live. Just follow the links to the live broadcast. That's uh, terrific. Uh, and uh, I don't know about five, and we're in five points uh, area, but we won't go into the media. Tell us briefly, so you've moved here. Mm -hmm. Are you going to, you're doing the, TV, uh, the radio show, or is that a TV show? It's a show? television show, actually. It's a television show on Free Speech Television Network, and Free Speech is on Dish and Direct to the tune of a universe of 40 million homes. It is a national show. And so we are uh, actually talking to not only what I call the people in the have states, where yes. they're, they are very legal, and of course there is this spectrum of, uh, of, of gray as far as how legal you are um, and then we are also broadcasting to or narrow casting as the case might be uh, to people in what I call the have-not states also because we do have a quote-unquote cannabis community it's very loosely knit and people are clamoring to come together and so that's the point of this show is to really show um, how uh, the emerging culture around this plant looks at any one point across the nation. I think we're all entitled to find relief from pain. And in fact, that's yes. how I, I really, I, it hit home with me in the late 1900s. I'm a nutritionist also, and I was a, a health reporter for a group of magazines. And I would talk about ho alternative and holistic approaches yes. to healing. Yes. And what came, kept coming up for me, Jeffrey, what I was seeing were people using, illegal, of course, mm -hmm. illegally using cannabis for pain relief. And at that time, the late, 19, the, uh, the late 90s, 1990s, I 
I just, because I was working for a family magazine, I just couldn't consciously talk about that and right. encourage somebody to right. break the law. And having said that, we actually, we stand on the shoulders of many activists and many advocates. Yes, we do. Uh, throughout, you know, all of these, these last yes, few do. decades here. Right. And so where I couldn't, I didn't go, thank God, uh, a lot of other pioneers um, in uh, moving toward right. uh, legalization were right. there for us. Right. There are a lot of pioneers and there were a lot of people that made this all happen. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, holistic medicine and natural remedies as well as the cannabis remedies have been there for quite some time. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. We're here live from uh, Green Labs in Denver, Colorado at tonight's event, a story-based approach to cannabis research, education, and training, uh, funding. And joining me is uh, Jordan Wellington and a local, your local attorney, are you? It, yes, I work in Denver. Do you think there's any future in uh, there being a change with the federal government? Do you see anything on the horizon, or is it still uh, an uphill battle for us? Uh, well, obviously everything is still an uphill battle for us, but we expect to see the law change probably in the next uh, two to five years. Two to five years would be good. Uh, it took us a little while to get our recreational marijuana, but we, we uh, excuse me, medical, and obviously then uh, recreation followed. And there were a lot of us uh, who worked very, very hard. Uh, obviously, right here in Denver, there's a lot of people who, who put that forward. Were you part of the uh, organization of the marijuana laws here in uh, Denver? Uh, yes, I worked for the law firm, uh, Vicente Cedarberg, and many of the partners were instrumental in passing Amendment 64, which legalized marijuana. Uh, I got involved by working with the uh, Colorado Legislature. I uh, worked on implementation on behalf of the General Assembly and then also worked at the Marijuana Enforcement Division and did implementation for them as well. You were with the MED? Uh, yes, I uh, was the policy analyst that ran implementation after Amendment 64 passed and did a lot of the working groups and drafted many of the regulations. For those of you who may not know what A, we often call it A64 or A uh, Amendment 64, what did, if you briefly, what did Amendment 64 do for us? It, if you uh, don't, again, if you don't know, here's the... It, it essentially prevented the state from criminalizing possession of marijuana and required the state of Colorado to establish a system of licensure and regulation for the commercial production and distribution of cannabis. And as we like to say, that's how we roll. So it, here in Colorado, it, it has, <laughs> thank you, it has passed. Uh, a lot of us who enjoy marijuana rec uh, recreationally or even medically, we may not be familiar with Amendment 64, which was so crucial, A64, for us. Are there other, uh, and it has changed, evolved several times, has it not, uh, since its implementation? Uh, sure. Amendment 64 is just a constitutional amendment, so it really just outlined the basic framework for the regulatory structure. Since then, uh, the legislature and the Marijuana Enforcement Division, along with uh, the Department of Public Health and Environment, Department of Agriculture, and many other local agencies have developed uh, the fleshed out the regulations, fleshed out the, the legal structure for how to produce and distribute cannabis. Right, and, and, and legally, this is what we can do. So uh, is there anything on the horizon or in the House Senate right now that you're aware of that might uh, make a change that we should be uh, aware of? Well, the Colorado legislature is uh, not in session right now, so we'll see what comes forward. I'm sure there'll be several pieces of legislation. Um, at this time, there's a couple of pieces of legislation that are introduced federally that would legalize marijuana, but we don't really expect those to move forward, uh, at least through before the election. We'll probably see other things happen. Um, and really, the, the biggest piece is really uh, legalization in other states, the ballot initiatives, um, such as in Massachusetts, Maine, Arizona, Nevada, and... California, which we expect to be on the 2016 ballot in November. Wow, this is uh, very, very comprehensive. And uh, uh, once again, we're moving forward with where we need to go with uh, legalization of uh, cannabis or marijuana, we call it. Is there, uh, off topic, is there some reason why we always call it marijuana instead of cannabis? Just uh, that just seems to be the colloquialism that people use regularly, uh, but cannabis is definitely a more accurate term. Yes, it is. And uh, but marijuana is, uh, we all know marijuana is, uh, as the term, uh, if you will. So uh, here in Denver, uh, you work for, uh, uh, for the MED, and um, they seem to be pretty stable now. Uh, applications do not, uh, for medical marijuana license, red card, uh, they're no longer the red card that uh, we used to have. They're, they're, they've really got their, uh, their uh, uh, 
um, procedure together. <laughs> I was thinking of something. And so everything seems to flow correctly with regard to the legalities, the performance, the regulations, and the necessities to either obtain the uh, medical marijuana card or uh, have one. However, it obviously, with recreational marijuana, A64, that is not necessary. Uh, you can ha possess, so we discussed this, uh, up to one ounce legally. Yes. And you may have your six plants uh, to grow. And so here in Denver, this is across the state of Colorado for everybody. Did everybody implement that here in Colorado, or is it by county or by jurisdiction? Uh, uh, no, uh, the counties are, are permitted to ban the commercial establishments. They can prohibit or further regulate, uh, for example, a retail marijuana store or a retail marijuana cultivation facility. But the individual personal protections apply across the board regardless of what a local government does. So regardless, if I understand this correctly, regardless of which county you reside in here in Colorado, you can't, may possess, as we discussed, the plants and your one ounce of marijuana. Even though the store, there may not be a store down the street, so to speak. Uh, sure, and provided the place, the owner of the property that you're on is okay with it. Oh yes, if you're a renter, <laughs> you can run into a few problems if you're a renter and the guidelines of the legal uh, lease. Sure. Uh, they put stuff in there. Uh, you, you probably can't walk onto your neighbor's property and do whatever you want there as well. Well, you shouldn't be doing that anyway, but... <laughs> probably. <laughs> and with regard to smoking marijuana in public, Aren't there some other, if, if I may, can we go into this? Uh, aren't there other guidelines that say marijuana can or cannot be smoked uh, publicly in public eye or something to that effect? Sure. Well, what Amendment 64 said was actually that uh, it doesn't in and of itself authorize the open and public consumption of marijuana. It doesn't protect consumption that is open and public. It's uh, the state or the localities are still permitted to criminalize that conduct. And what we've seen is many municipalities, or several at least across Colorado, have elected to adopt regulations for yes. these types of establishments. Pueblo, uh, Colorado Springs, Nederland, to uh, name a couple of them, have actually embraced these and adopted regulations. Uh, just outside Denver, we uh, are seeing some war uh, activity around regulations in Englewood, which may also establish uh, a regulated structure for these types of establishments. And we're also hoping to see uh, Denver move forward with regulations in about the next year or so. The more that you discuss these issues and come up with effective solutions, you tend to uh, promote public safety, you tend to establish rules of the road and guidelines for people. So uh, just as we've seen with in, uh, taking um, you know, marijuana out of the hands of drug dealers and put it into licensed regulated facilities, I think we'd see similar benefits by regulating cannabis consumption in a social environment. Uh, and obviously I agree, but you know, I'm not part of the legislation or the make up that committee, but the necessity for that dissemination of uh, information and making it public, publicly safe, in my opinion, is very, very important because we do have a lot of people visiting the state and they're unfamiliar with the laws and the regulations. Didn't the MED have a flyer or something they had produced? Are you familiar with that? Uh, Just a sidebar here. Uh, you know, the state created a campaign called Good to Know, which yes, was a, a really was, wonderful yes. campaign that tried right. to advise people of what right. the, 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 new the new laws and, and what the boundaries are and things of that nature. Uh, and people coming from out of state are a great example on the public consumption issue as well because uh, you know, they, people they don't come, know. They, they, well, they, not only don't they know, but they come and they stay in a hotel and it's really not the environment that they'd like to be in to consume. Right. And so, you know, they are really left without any choices as well. Uh, we have a lot of people coming to Colorado. Some will like to consume cannabis, some don't. Uh, but those that do should be provided with an environment to do so and encouraging to hide in their hotel rooms, uh, which generally are non-smoking, is probably not the most productive thing. Right. And when you say provide an environment for them, we're talking about a safe valid and legal environment, are we not? That's really what we're trying to promote. Most certainly, where, yeah, where yeah, identification is, is unchecked, uh, it should be in compliance with Clean Indoor Air Act requirements, and everything else that we would expect to see from, from a well-regulated facility. Right, so th there's a couple variables here that need to be looked at. The Clean Air Act is one of them, of course, smoking indoors here in Colorado, which is uh, not permitted uh, on indoor venues. Uh, even at the at the stadium, we're not allowed to smoke. You have to go what in the back row or out in the whatever you call that area. Uh, that's for cigarette consumption. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you cannot smoke marijuana at the uh, at the stadium. 
And that you means, cannot smoke marijuana at the ballpark. <laughs> uh, subject to change, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, this is what we have here in Colorado. And if you're new to the state, uh, do you have that website handy by the chan uh, by chance? Can we, can't throw it up. All right. Um, uh, what what website? Uh, that was the Good to Know. That was run by no, the good state. Good to Know campaign was run by the state. Yes. Right. Is that Good to Know dot com? Do you um, know? Or? I'm sure if you Google Good to Know and Colorado, you'll come up with the website. There you go. Please do that. If you're visiting us from out of state, please do that because it's very very, very important that not only do we protect you, but we want to protect the freedoms that we've gained. And any uh, any abuse of those uh, policies would help promote to the uh, what the other side of the coin. What do you call the opponents? Uh, uh, what, what I like to say is that uh, uh, marijuana legalization is not a, a right or a privilege; it's a responsibility. And uh, what I mean by that is that you know you should behave appropriately and in accordance with the law, so that we can expand these freedoms to the rest of the world. That, that very well spoken. That's exactly what I was trying to say. I appreciate it. It's uh, because we have gained these freedoms, and under no circumstances would we like to lose them just because we weren't paying attention or not following the guidelines and the laws. So uh, yes, most right, certainly. Right. All right. So. Do we, uh, well, uh, I know you said I'm uh, interviewing, do we have uh, Sure, I, well, I, I'd like to mention something, why yes, not? Please. Uh, so uh, a bunch of us have uh, started and we're working on developing a nonprofit organization called the uh, Cannabis Outreach and Education Network. Uh, we put on our first event several months ago in Denver. Uh, it was uh, generally a symposium uh, of uh, medical researchers talking about the work that they're doing on the efficacy of medical cannabis and the potential consequences of cannabis use. Um, and many of these researchers have been funded by a program through the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, where they have uh, funded researchers to look at things like post-traumatic stress disorder, epilepsy, chronic pain, uh, consequences and, and impacts on your lungs and things of that nature. Uh, and what we're trying to do through this organization is essentially provide free educational conferences. Uh, these would be for both patients, uh, the general public and doctors. Uh, the one at uh, National Jewish that we've done already was actually CME accreditation. So right, doctors right. were able to get their uh, continuing education credits by attending and the whole goal was to really promote uh, a very educational environment where people were allowed to talk about what kind of work they're doing and what they've been finding so far. Did you present at the National Jewish event? I was unable to make that at the hospital. Uh, no, I, I'm an attorney. I, uh, you know, allow the, the doctors medical, to speak. Yeah, that was yeah, for the medical it's, it's people. Not, it's not my place. Okay, but we did have that, and we have more and more of those happening all the time, do we not? And uh, this yeah. is what, in my opinion, this is what we need. So that the education and the talk, the dialogue, which is, it sounds like you're promoting as well, continues. Uh, yeah, I generally feel like if you put a, a whole bunch of smart people in a room together, good things happen. <laughs> and you don't necessarily need to control what it's going to be. No, no, good things do happen as, as the obvious uh, as we've collected and we're able to get these uh, laws uh, enacted here in Colorado. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're here live in Denver, Colorado from Green Labs. Uh, broadcasting tonight on cable channel uh, 56 and on the internet wmmjtv.com slash live and with us tonight is uh, with me is um, Kevin Kevin yes yes sir uh, Kevin Kevin Walters Walters tell me a little bit about Kevin Walters please yeah yeah so I'm a uh, doctoral student I'm a graduate student at Colorado State University in Fort Collins uh, my my program up there is called industrial organizational psychology which is really the scientific study of the workplace. And within IO psychology, we call it, uh, my specific niche is something called occupational health psychology, which goes beyond just the, the workplace to focus on the psychosocial health and well-being of the workers in that workplace. And so really we're focused on protecting and promoting the mental health and well-being of these workers. And in the workplace and the mental health, are we discussing the use of or the uh, proximity of cannabis slash marijuana? Right, yeah, so, so really we're- Does that affect the workplace? Uh, so, so that's what we're looking into. That's one of the things we're looking into, I should say. Really, uh, I, guess, I guess to give you some context, the way I got into this industry was uh, back in the fall of 2013, I was in a class for, for graduate school, and as part of this course, we were put on these interdisciplinary teams to go into organizations and do a general evaluation on health and safety. And it just so happened that I was on a group that went to a dispensary here, here in Denver, or a dispensary and grow house, I should say, the whole organization. And as we were talking to these folks, we learned a lot about what work is like in the industry, but yes. most importantly, we learned that no one's really looked at health and safety of these workers before. Uh, I think the government's just got their hands tied, you know, ensuring compliance of all these organizations in general. And so, so realizing this, we figured we would step up to the plate and do what we could to try and protect these workers and, and, see, and see what we can do to just 
help improve their lives a little bit because we don't really know what, what the conditions are at these workplaces. There's really no overarching regulation. And so at this point, we've collected our data. This all happened uh, earlier this year. We wrapped up data collection at the end of June this year. And so what we've been doing thus far is analyzing our results, doing some write-ups. Uh, currently, we have finished most of our statistical analyses, and we are developing a report for the industry. This is great. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's, that's one thing we want to do. We're calling this a research to practice project, meaning that not only are we doing uh, action research in the industry, but we're taking it to use some practical applications for these workers. And so in our report, we're going to give some basic information on what we found, uh, what, what problems there might be in the workplace. And also, we're going to use this to develop training recommendations for the industry so yeah. that we can, we can give them something to do to address these issues right away. And so at this point, I guess I wouldn't want to share too much information because I'd like to make sure the industry is the one who gets their hands on it okay. first. All right. All right. Um, but basically, we are assessing uh, different psychological stressors in the workplace, uh, different physical stressors in the workplace, so things like working with the plants, all that jazz, uh, and, and also the, the reasons individuals are working in this industry, uh, what their own individual perception is of these hazards, because if it's a hazard, that's great, and we can do something about it, but we also want to know if they know that it's a hazard in the first place. And, and so really we're trying to address all these different things with this one project. Well, you know, I know some people who trim in the industry, mm -hmm. and I don't know any of them that are stressed in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. I, I, I know you said you mentioned that, uh -huh. and you're, you also mentioned you're doing active research, which means you've got to be participating or visiting them uh, mm -hmm. on site, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But I'll say again, of all the people I know, I'm not saying I know everybody, but. I didn't mean anybody who wasn't uh, pleasant and smiling and <laughs> yeah, real happy yeah. to be sitting there and getting paid, no uh -huh. less, to trim marijuana. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, have you looked at the other side of the coin and how much how much glow that adds to these people and how they feel as opposed to any stress or, or a degradation that may fall upon mm -hmm. them? It seems to me they're just they're they're all just happy as a lark. Yeah, yeah, and uh, well first it's funny you mentioned that because you know when I tell certain people in my field about what we're doing, they're like, uh, who working in the cannabis industry is going to be stressed that, out? That's kind of what yeah. I'm saying. Like intuitively yeah, yeah, yeah. you would think not. Um, <laughs> well I've seen it, you know, I'm just, I'm not a trimmer, but no, I, yeah, I've yeah, seen it. Definitely. You know, yeah, and, and it's funny that you mentioned that because one thing we're also tapping into with this is sort of like a sense of purpose that individuals get from their job, something we call meaningfulness of work. And we know that individuals who work in a job where they really get a, a good sense of purpose from it, they feel like right. they, they're giving something back. Right. That has positive implications for both them in terms of their, their own well-being and also for their organization in terms of what they're bringing to the job. And so that's another thing we're capturing with our yes, survey. So, there you go. so maybe you should you should become an occupational health psychologist because <laughs> because you're spot on there. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm stuck on the TV show, but okay. that's okay. We'll have you on to discuss it for us. You're only, you're right up the street in Fort Collins. Yeah, yeah, right? short drive. Right, yeah. right, and and the school was sponsoring this study, or did you guys get a grant for that, or how did that uh, come about? So uh, this all started back in. So I mentioned in fall 2013 is when we first got into the industry. In in spring of 25th, or excuse me, 2014. Uh, we applied for a grant uh, through NIOSH. I'm a trainee in occupational health psychology through something called the Mountains and Plains Education and Research Center. And, and, and through my, my traineeship there, I was able to apply for this, what they call a pilot grant, uh, through NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And, and so we were able to acquire some funding in order to do this study. And, and it really was a lifesaver in terms of being able to do this, right. th this research because it required a lot of resources to do this. You know, I had to make a lot of trips. I, I think I can honestly say I might be one of the only people who's been to every dispensary in Fort Collins, Boulder, and probably about a wow. fifth in Denver or so. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the award doors. is, but yeah, lots of door knocking. And so, <laughs> so really, it, it was a very resource intensive process. And so we were very fortunate to have that funding there to help us through that. Well, you mentioned occupational therapy and safety, and that's really what we're talking about, the safety for the workers who are employed in this industry. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, as I understand it, we really have no study or information behind uh, what, the effects or, as I said, they're all smiling and mm -hmm. happy, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. there must still be some, there potentially, let me just say, some side effects or some... Uh, 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 especially working with uh, in the grow with the mm -hmm. pesticides and other things that uh, you know like any operation you would wear gloves or uh, 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 hopefully some sort of protective uh, gear right right uh, the purpose of, of 
a person in the grow room wearing the protective gear is more so to keep the plants from getting the human infection mm -hmm. as opposed to the plants giving uh, an infection or infection, excuse me, to, uh, to the human. Uh, do I have that right, or is that? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, I, in, I, in the operations, I mean, it's not a clean room, and mm -hmm. it's not an OR, but you still take the precautions to um, effectively prevent the spread of what inhabitants or diseases. Yeah, you know, there's, or, there's uh, things like like mildew, mold. All those are huge issues when you're growing the cannabis plant. And, and and as you mentioned, you know, quality control is huge in this industry. Uh, you know, some of these grow houses I've been to, they're, they're rooms with a quarter million dollars worth of product in that room. Yes. And, and yes. things like mold and mildew, from what I hear, you know, I'm not a grower, but I hear that those things can spread overnight if you let them. And, and so quality control is huge. And so like you said, you know, right. all that PPE, that personal protective equipment, a lot of times they use it just to protect the plants themselves. Right, right. And that's really, that's, right. How I, yeah. I, I, that's how I originally viewed it. Mm -hmm. But as a, you're really trying to prevent what you're bringing in as exactly. contaminants exactly. to your plants because the commercial grow we really want that to be uh, to be uh, the mm -hmm. way to go. Yeah, yeah. And so one thing we're doing is uh, asking them about side effects of adaptogenic pesticides, things like that, about use of personal protective equipment. Because ideally, they'll be using it to protect both themselves and the plant, and it could be a win-win for everyone. Do you have? Uh, so your your study hasn't been published yet. So there's not a website where people can go and see the results of the Correct. study yeah, yet. Yeah. Or, um, uh, but it will be published through uh, University of uh, Colorado, or so, will it be independent um, through your group? So uh, there, there's a couple steps in the process. The first thing we'll do is develop the industry report, which we'll disseminate through the contacts we made in the industry. Uh, and then beyond that, we might submit to publication. But that's really our individual authors writing up a manuscript right. and submitting it to certain academic journals. And mm -hmm. so that, that's kind of yet to be determined, I would All say. Right. Well, obviously, we look forward to seeing it. Yeah. I personally want to want to read it as well. And uh, and uh, so ho uh, hopefully that uh, you have a projected uh, timeline when that'll be available, that report will be available. Uh, we're, we're hoping early spring, I'd early say. Early spring. Probably, probably a good bet. All right. If you're just joining us, I really appreciate you coming down tonight. Yeah. We're here Sorry, live man. in Denver. We're broadcasting from um, uh, Green Labs in Denver, Colorado. We're on Comcast Channel 56. We're on the internet at wmmjtv.com/live.